Number 50, Walk Don't Run by The Ventures, the swinging soundtrack of the surfing scene. Fender twin reverb amps, brunette drumming and a garage vibe. Wonderful. 49, wrote a song for everyone, Credence Clearwater Revival. The emotional centerpiece of CCR's Green River, it focuses on how well those who govern us know the devices of government, but how little they know those of us who consent to be governed by them. Number 48, Sweet, Judy Blue Eyes, Crosby, Stills and Nash. Swathed in brilliant harmonies, Stephen Stills' bittersweet parting note to Judy Collins is a timeless examination of the contradictions of love. 47, Like a Rolling Stone, Bob Dylan. From the whip-crack opening drum beat through the stately keyboards to perhaps Dylan's greatest ever vocals, few records scream 1960s like this era-defining song. 46, Good Vibrations, The Beach Boys. Brian Wilson was the George Gershwin of the 1960s, another record that defines the era but on diametrically opposite terms than those of Like a Rolling Stone. Number 45, I Heard It Through the Grapevine by Marvin Gaye. The first record by a black artist to sell 3 million copies, this brilliantly produced exercise in atmosphere goads Motown's best male vocalist to a masterful performance. This was effectively the template for Norman Whitfield's other masterpiece, Papa Was a Rolling Stone. Number 44, Bad Moon Rising, Creedence Clearwater Revival. The song immediately following wrote a song for everyone on Green River. John Fogarty here demonstrates the consequences of those who are governed withdrawing their permission to be so. 43. Satisfaction, The Rolling Stones. Inarguably a great record and an important one. A cultural earthquake, in fact, it's simply been done to death by the band on the road acting as some kind of boomer rally call or as an experience at high value 30-somethings can say they paid for the privilege of increasingly decrepit once worse to play. 42. Alabama, John Coltrane. Train's gentle eulogy to the four victims of the Birmingham church bombing in September 1963 displays not only his gentlest tone, but his invention, basing the rhythm on speech patterns of Martin Luther King. 41. God Only Knows, The Beach Boys. Dusting aside all the fashionable blather this song and pet sounds in general attracted, this is a masterfully made record. The fact that Carl Wilson had been a lead vocalist for less than a year when he made this is incredibly impressive in itself. Number 40, Little Wing, Jimi Hendrix. What's your favourite Hendrix solo? This is mine, the 58 second Univibe drenched burst at the end. It's equal parts mad scientist, part comfort food, part buddy guy. 39, the girl from Ebenema, Stan Getz and Zhao Gilberto. Far from the elevated music this seems to have been relegated to, this gentle, tuneful bossa nova took Stan Getz into the mainstream. It is believed that after yesterday, this is the most recorded song in history. 38. Spoonful by Howling Wolf. Wolf masticated every syllable like a dog with a bone. Hubert Sumlin is positively vituperative with his guitar. Willie Dixon is the supreme poet of the blues. 37. Visions of Johanna by Bob Dylan. Drawn perhaps from T.S. Eliot's Rhapsody on a Windy Night, Dylan's battle between the mysteries of the flesh and the insanity of the real hovers like a ghost above one of his most musically and lyrically intense songs. 36. The Ecstasy of Gold, Ennio Morricone. The theme to the epic conclusion of Sergio Leone's The Good, The Bad and The Ugly here, we have grandeur, sweep and scale which fills the air with noble moments, even more so than the film's iconic opening theme. 35. America, Simon and Garfunkel. Paul Simon's ode to the innocence of love and its dissipation as what he found descended from the halcyon days of 1964 to the bloody mess of 1968. Then they all went to look for America to find it gone or unrecognisable. 34. Born in Chicago, Paul Butterfield Blues Band. Butterfield's band made two superb albums, their self-titled debut and East West. 
This track taken from the debut emblemizes the transition of the blues from a black urban form to one that increasingly became one of the key ingredients in the funky burgoo that became rock. 33, Tomorrow Never Knows, The Beatles, or Five Go Mad in St. John's Wood. John Lennon's rationalization of the id versus the head, there's possibly no record where each Beatle contributed so completely and critically than this. 32, Don't Worry Baby by The Beach Boys. Brian Wilson's love life was complex. In 1964, he was dating the 16-year-old Marilyn Rovell. He was actually in love with Marilyn's older sister, Diane. Don't Worry Baby is a masterpiece of the longing and sexual insecurity that came out of Wilson's mental degeneration and his being torn between two lovers. 31. The Locomotion by Little Eva. The only song to make number one in Australia for three different acts, Eva, Grand Funk and Kylie. Forget Tapestry, this is Carole King's Shining Hour. Number 30, How Blue Can You Get, B.B. King. From his masterful Live at the Regal album, the last verse of this is one of the most glorious pieces of political incorrectness ever put to wax. And there's some pretty good guitar playing on it too. 29, The Kids Are Alright, The Who. An utter flop on the charts, this remains an internal delight and proof perfect that for peel power pop, pound for pound, the Who could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Kinks or the Beatles. 28. I just don't know what to do with myself. Dusty Springfield. A Bacharach David masterpiece and very possibly the best UK soul record ever made. 27. Chain of Fools, Aretha Franklin. Jimmy Johnson and Joe South weave a web of sorcery while the great Roger Hawkins lays down his patented super cool hustle. This is soul music at its funkiest, at its nastiest, and its most engaging. 26. Circle, Miles Davis. The fundamental difference between 50s and 60s jazz is that 50s jazz valued the collaborative and the 60s more the individual. On the superb circle, first Miles, then Wayne Shorter cut wonderful solos, but finally a superb classically flavoured hand by Herbie Hancock blows them out of the water and makes high watermarks for Miles' peerless catalogue, but also for the decade as a whole. 25. It had to be here. Be My Baby by the Ronettes. The drum beat that launched a thousand ships in Phil Spector and Hal Blaine's legacy. Anyone who thinks pop was dead before the Beatles should be referred here forthwith. 24. Telstar. The Tornadoes. Refer as above. Joe Meek pours out his tortured soul in a tiny studio in North London and creates a record that still sounds damn weird 60 years on. 23. Grazing in the Grass by Hugh Masekela. The only South African record on our countdown. Well, not strictly. It was recorded at Gold Star in Hollywood. This song, based on a Zambian shepherd's cowbell, was a US number one and a big favourite according to his autobiography of Miles Davis. 22. I Fall to Pieces, Patsy Cline. Few singers left us so profound a legacy in so brief a time as Patsy Cline. The astonishing growth of her craft, both as a country and a pop singer over five years, is unapproached. Of course, tragedy took her, but we were lucky to have her while we did. Number 21. Your Mind is on Vacation, Mose Allison. The Bard of Taipu, Mississippi put out this single in 1962, and despite an eclectic back catalogue that drew on Willie Nelson and Duke Ellington as well as his own tunes, this one set the bar for the dry wit with which his career has forever been associated. Into the top 20 with number 20, You Can't Always Get What You Want by the Rolling Stones. The Stones' supreme masterpiece, the record surpasses the song it was supposed to imitate, Hey Jude, in all ways imaginable and replaces it with an artful and literate commentary that segues between optimism and weary resignation. 19. Waterloo Sunset by The Kinks. The supreme moment where romance meets a journalist's eye as Ray Davies paints an eloquent, elegant picture, timeless, yet cast in stone in time. I wonder whatever became of Terry and Julie. 18. Stop in the Name of Love by The Supremes. One of Motown's grandest achievements, 
flawlessly written, arranged and produced and performed in a tiny room on 2648 West Grand Boulevard in a decaying industrial city. The sound of joy resonated from that room throughout the world. 17. Crazy by Patsy Cline. Possibly the best song Willie Nelson ever wrote and also very possibly the best record Patsy Cline ever laid down, succeeding her previous single I Fall to Pieces. A record so enduringly popular, even in 1996, it was still the most ever played tune on American jukeboxes. All of Klein's formidable talents are brought to focus on this masterpiece of American record playing. Number 16, The Long One, the final majestic triumph in a majestic career. The near culmination of the fitting inclusion to the music of the decade they did in so many parts vitalize, propel and set the bar for the furtherance of. I'm of course talking about the long medley on side B of the Abbey Road album by the Beatles. It's a disappointment the subsequent album came to fall well short of the bar, but that's a 70s problem. 15. I'd Rather Go Blind by Etta James. Etta's Heartbreaker is an and of itself the answer to the question, what is soul? One of the many highlights from the legendary famed studios in Muscle Shoals, Alabama, along with its boisterous A-side, Tell Mama. Number 14, Penny Lane by The Beatles. The best testimony to the awesome scope of the 60s music is that this song sets a full 54 places higher than its esteemed A-side. A song of summer freedom, of a working lad skylighting with a few quid in your pocket. It's McCartney's supreme story song, the band's most singularly realised musical construction. It's also the point at which McCartney surpassed Lennon as the songwriting focus for the band. 13. Wonderful Land by The Shadows. In the 1960s, there were but three records that spent as many as eight weeks atop the UK charts. Sugar Sugar by the Archies, Are You Lonesome Tonight by Elvis, and The Shining Glory of the Shadows Wonderful Land. The longest running number ones in the US for the equivalent period were a pair of Nine Weekers, Percy Faith's Theme from a Summer Place, and The Beatles' Interminable Hey Jude. Wonderful Land is a stirring production featuring Jerry Lorden's sweeping, uplifting melody, Norrie Paramore's graceful French horn and string arrangements, topped by Hank Marvin, the UK's first true guitar superstar's technically masterful solo and his unique tone. One of the most glorious records ever made, this is ample proof of the canard that rock and roll died between the loss of Elvis et al. and the rise of the Beatles. It's like flying. It's the last sweep over a fading summer. The dappled light in the autumnal chill gather. It is Gotha Damerung to the gods of summer. It is the herald of crepuscular dimness for months. But we don't mind. We revel in the autumn of this record. 12. Will You Love Me Tomorrow by the Shirelles. The lover's ultimate question. Jerry Goffin wrote the timeless lyric about the anxieties of a young woman and the newfound challenges of sexual liberation. Before the Beatles ruled the world, it was was a smaller world indeed. Yet, Carol King's front doorbell still plays Will You Love Me Tomorrow. Number 11. Non Je Regetarian by Edith Piaf. Piaf's defiant anti-De Gaullist anthem, adopted as the marching song of the first foreign parachute legion as they led the 1962 insurrection, and the foreign legion still sings it on the parade ground. An indelibly French artefact, proud, emotional, dark as un petit noir, and Piaf the very core. Into the top 10, people, I want you back at number 10 by the Jackson 5. I'd hazard to say this is the latest released record in the entire list, arriving as it did in late October, early November 1969. But what a better late than never it was. Atop a classic tension and release opening chord pattern, there came probably the greatest of all Motown bass tracks. Over that, the astonishing 11-year-old Michael Jackson serving his apprenticeship here on the path, to be one of the greatest vocalists of all time. Number nine, The Tracks of My Tears, Smokey Robinson and the Miracles. My favorite lyric of the 60s and perhaps of any song, less riddled with faux literary pretension than Paul Simon and an internal psychodrama less willfully oblique than El Bobo. The Tracks of My Tears, couched in a gorgeous soft soul arrangement, strips back the traditionally constructed layers of black machismo and replaces them with poetry, vulnerability and pain. Number eight, The Tide is High by The Paragons. 
Near the scar nor reggae, this is in fact the high point of the rock steady style, a slower, more melodically intense music that came about as a result for a need of dance music to slow down during the epic heat waves of 1967. Duke Reed made a plethora of great singles for his Treasure Island label in the 60s and early 70s, but this is most likely the greatest. Number 7, Green Onions by Booker T and the MGs. A simple admission, this is without exception probably my favourite record of all time. It's not the best, but it's my favourite record of all time. An unremitting groove, relentless funk and ceaseless biting guitar playing. So much so that Steve Cropper is still my all-time guitar hero. Number six, People Get Ready by The Impressions. Taking the most sincere elements of his gospel upbringing, the most excoriating elements of rising black social commentary, and the sweetest tincture of his pop-sensible groove, Curtis Mayfield created an anthem to hope that transcends time itself and mere decades seem nugatory when we truly consider what timelessness lies in Curtis Mayfield's voice. Number five, Dancing in the Streets, Martha and the Vandellas. High-minded as Mayfield's previous offering may have been, there is an abiding and very valid image of the 60s as a time when simply yielding to mass change was a high rebellion, exercising your newfound upper mobility by going to a go-go, making a West Coast pilgrimage, or even the simple act of throwing open the windows on a hot summer night and taking the party down at the street. And the fact that you have one of the most exciting records of the decade to soundtrack this new interpersonal politics can't hurt, can it? Number four. California Girls by the Beach Boys. One of the great lost volumes of the 60s lies in the mishandling and naked exploitation of the Beach Boys, particularly their genius in residence, Brian Wilson. While their erstwhile label mates, the Beatles were permitted to work at a much more leisurely pace. The perfect example was in 1965, as both bands were at work crafting a new sonic palette for pop music. The Beatles hamstrung if by time rather than ambition in making help, and the Beach Boys leapt ahead with the auteur-driven records like the ground breaking today and summer days and summer nights and there's no better articulation of the auteur as record maker beyond even Phil Spector than Brian Wilson's grasp of arrangement, melody and near mythic vision of his band. California Girls may very well be the very best slice of pure pop for the 1960s. Number three, In a Silent Way by Miles Davis. Much like his idol Frank Sinatra, Miles Davis had a leaner time of in the 60s as he did in the 50s. But that isn't to say that Davis was left behind. He just became more idiosyncratic, a little cranky, and willfully disregarding of his own legacy. With In a Silent Way, Teo Massaro edits the music as something resembling classic sonata format, exposition, development and recapitulation. Davis does away with swing, preferring swirling textures, cavernous keyboards and rockish riffery. It's safe to say that jazz at this point was dead and Miles killed it. Number two, She Loves You by The Beatles. I'm sure I've said this somewhere before, but this is the 60s musical equivalent of the moment in The Wizard of Oz when it all goes from sepia to technicolor. And it's all because the Beatles woke up one morning and remembered that they had an absolute beast of a drummer. So they let Ringo off the chain and the transition from the polite twee twist beat drummer from me to you is unfathomable. His technique is quirky, but he beats those tubs like he owes them money. This, in a large part, is how rock and roll became rock music. Number one. Change is Gonna Come by Sam Cooke. The greatest soul singer ever there was, Sam Cooke was run out of Shreveport, Louisiana and charged with disturbing the peace after being refused a room at the Holiday Inn in October 1963. Cooke turned what was at first a fighting rage into a song of the everyday experience of racism in America, with barely a shred of the charity that the son of a preacher man might harbour. The song was released on Cooke's Ain't That Good News album in February 1964. Cooke sang it but once on Johnny Carson's show and came away with a masterful performance, only for the Beatles to play Ed Sullivan two days later and erase Cook's record from the memory. Nine months later, Cook lay dead in a flea bag motel at 91st and South Figueroa Street in South Central Los Angeles. A change indeed was going to come.